So anyway, it kept me awake. And one of the arguments I had with Lisa was, I, I said, it keeps me awake. And then on the way back, we saw a guy who obviously didn't know the peanut trick because he'd fallen asleep off the road in the ditch. Check. Check. you didn't notice I'm still me <laughs> always will be Heck.
Good morning. And welcome to our service of worship here at Roseland United Methodist Church. And if you're watching at home, we're glad you're there. And uh, wish you were here. Really, wish you were here. There's somebody wrote a song like that. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a beautiful day. And Cindy's going to come up right now. And she is going to tell you our announcements for the week. home. Good morning to everyone here. We are so glad you are here, as Dave said. Um, we want to remind you or address once again the COVID response because it is kind of happening again. So if you're fully vaccinated, masks are optional, but we ask if you wear a mask. If you have not yet become vaccinated, we encourage you to do that. Um, be sensitive to the children who are 12 and under who can't be vaccinated yet. So we just want to keep that in mind. Um, we want to thank Reverend John Brown, who's been leading worship at the 11 o'clock service for the month of July while Carlene was away. And uh, we're going to thank him, and they'll thank him again at the 11 o'clock. Um, the Community Connection Team, it's really exciting. They're collecting supplies for the preschool. Items being collected are listed in your bulletin, and those of you who are at home can find them on the website. You can drop off your items at the Welcome Center on Sundays or at the church office during the week. There is a Bible study every Tuesday evening at 6.30 with Pastor Jerry leading it. And uh, as the group grows, we're going to be meeting in the sanctuary starting this week. So rather in the church office, we're going to be meeting here because it's getting big and it's really exciting. So if you haven't yet come, come and join us. We're looking at the Gospel of John. And on Wednesday mornings at 7 a.m. each week, Pastor Jerry will have a short communion service and then we'll meet for breakfast uh, at a uh, local restaurant or you can just head off to work so set your alarm because we'd love to see you there and finally the united methodist men are having their monthly meeting in the bulletin it says monday august 3rd but monday august 3rd is not the right date august 2nd is the date it's monday and it's in the fellowship hall they're a social group they do church and local missions and they love to eat if you are a man, you love to eat, I don't know any who don't, please come and join them. Uh, they gather for fellowship at 5.30, dinner served at 6, and then there's a short business meeting. So if you're curious, come on by on August 2nd and look at the men's group and have fun. Have a great worship. I hear they're, uh, th they're going to have pierogies. Okay, it sounds good. That's fine. Um, let's start our service this morning with a prayer. And you know how we start, right? It is good morning, God. As we come here to worship this morning, uh, we are reminded, as evidenced by this absolutely beautiful day outside that you have made, that it is you and it's you alone who are worthy. So with all our hearts and all our strength, we give you all our worship and we give you all our praise. In Jesus' name we pray. And we're going to start this morning's service off with, you are worthy of my praise. See how I did that? Sing with me. I will worship with all of my heart, and I will praise you with all of my strength. I will see you with all of my days. And I will follow all of your ways, all your ways. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy. I will bow down 
hail you as king. And I will serve you, you everything. I will lift up my eyes to your throne. And I will trust you, I will trust you alone, trust you alone. I will give you all my worship, I will give you all my praise. You alone, alone to worship, you alone are worthy. Come on down, Gary. You got door number one right there. This is our morning prayer. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or wherever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Lord, thank you for all you have given us this day. We pray that you will guide our children in the school this upcoming year. Give our teachers the help and knowledge they need to succeed. Please lay your hands on this church and its congregation to heal the sick, the troubled, those in hospitals, our military. Please bring back our POWs and MIAs. Our country is in need of healing and understanding for our leaders, our president, and his staff. We pray for all our pastors and our families. Let us be disciples for your word and pray the prayer in which your son Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, we are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. This is a song called Born Again. This is. Um, by Third Day, and um, it's written by Mac Powell. And it just, just talks about the promise that God made to us and what happens to you when you receive his promise. Today I found myself 
After searching all these years But the man that I saw He wasn't at all who I thought he'd be I was lost when you found me here And I was broken beyond repair You came along And you sang your song over me Feels like I'm born again Feels like I'm living For the very first time First time in my life. Make a promise to me now. Reassure my heart somehow that the love that I feel is so much more real than anything. I feel it in my soul And I pray that I'm not wrong The life I have now It is only the beginning Sing with me Feels like I'm born again Feels like I'm living For the very first time First time feels like I'm breathing, feels like I'm moving for the very first time, for the very first time. I wasn't looking for something that was more than what I had yesterday. And you came to me and you gave to me life that I love that I've never known that I've never found before feels like I'm born again feels like I'm living for the very first time for the very first time Oh, I'm up. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Lazarus. Right. We gotta come, come up forth. with a, We gotta come up with a signal. Yeah, sort of like Jerry. <laughs> come on up. You know, if you're not obvious, I'm not very subtle. I just I won't get it. I don't know. I Take it. a poll. I don't know if there's anybody more obvious than me. I don't know. I see the, uh, the expert is in the audience. What do you think, Linda? <laughs> all right, I'll let us all off the hook. Somebody take my shovel away, okay? Uh, so I like that song that we just sang. Um, it speaks about a great truth. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear on what it means to be lost and what it means to be found, but the church somehow has lost its sense of what the message is, and we've tried to turn it into all kinds of other things. Uh, not bad things, but not the main thing. So here we are. This is my, what, third message, fourth message? I don't know. Is it third? No, no, I'm not counting per se. I'm just trying to remember. How long have we been here? Since the 4th of July. Thanks. That helps. All right. Uh, so we're going to talk about lost, lost. Uh, there's no story quite so dramatic as that of the lost person. Could be, uh, you know, we read Hans Christian Andersen's got great stories about lostness. Mark Twain, do you remember when Huckleberry Finn ran away from home and all that stuff? Anybody here ever run away from home? 
Really? I'm the only one? Oh, there's three of us, I think, in that group. Okay. I remember, you know, I got mad at my mom for something, you know. Maybe she didn't give me enough hamburger. I don't know. Uh, so I said, I'm leaving. She says, really? How long are you going to be gone? I'm going to be gone forever. Really? Well, you better take a, a snack with you because dinner's not till six. Oh, I said, I won't be late. <laughs> so, but lost. What exactly does it really mean to be lost? And Alzheimer's patient that uh, family wants to keep at home uh, wanders away. Lisa's grandpa, Brager, did that, wandered down US 24, a major road, right down the center of trucks by, passing by 60, 65 mile an hour, till a, 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 a Allen County Sheriff spotted him, picked him up, and brought him home. Lost. A teenager is depressed because of the way they've been portrayed in social media and the way they're treated at school and maybe even at home. So they take an overdose of pills that are all too easily available. Lost. Webster's Dictionary, which is still the best place to get your definitions, by the way, because people consider them for more than five minutes before they post them on the web. Not every definition you find on the web is, carries much weight. So, but Webster's Dictionary defines lost as unable to find the way. Think about that. Unable to find the way. In other words, uh, you're not satisfied where you are. Maybe you're not safe where you are, so you want to get somewhere else. But you don't know how to get there. You don't know the way. In a simple sense, we become disoriented and don't know which way to start. You know, we, we describe those without Christ as being what? Oh, I love it. You guys are quick. This is great. Uh, it, it comes from this exchange between the resurrected Jesus and his disciples. And they were lost. They were disoriented by the death of the one they thought was going to throw down the Roman rulers. The one they thought was going to restore the glory of King David's throne. And now he's dead. You don't get much more lost than that. So let's read together John 14, 4, so you'll understand why we call those without Christ lost. Read it with me, would you? You know where I'm going and how to get there. How would you like Jesus to say that to you? Yeah, 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 but it's true. Even more so for us than for those original followers. So Thomas was honest. Some of us are dishonest, and we claim that we don't know the way. There's one thing about being an honest doubting Thomas. It's another to be a dishonest doubting Thomas. You know, you can be a person of another faith perspective and honestly be an agnostic. So well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure there is a way or that I can know the way. You can do that with almost any other faith position because no other faith leader throughout history has honestly and provocatively claimed to be the way. But an agnostic Christian is a dishonest position. I cannot know if Jesus is the way. Defaults to Jesus is not the way. Or at least not for me and maybe not for you. So Thomas was there as an honest agnostic. But today, based on the witness of the Spirit, the testimony of history, and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit, we can't make this claim. So let's read his claim and then step into the story of what it means to be lost on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. So he said, no, we don't know. That's right. We haven't any idea where you're going. Where did Jesus go when he died? Well, for some of us who have a little understanding of RC, he did go to the Father, but first he descended to where? We pulled it out of our catechism of faith, but it's still in the RC version of the Apostle Creed. What does it say? He descended to the, to the dead. Sheol, technically. The, the abode of the dead. All right. So he descended to the dead for how long? Three days. So we know he was dead, 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 is what we believe as Protestants. Uh, we don't believe he went down to witness those in, in hell. All right. But if you're comfortable with that, that's okay. It's not a salvation issue. Okay, we can think and let think. John Wesley started that idea, and we continue it to this day. So, but we haven't any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Know the way. That is the central core to Christianity. What is the mission of the United Methodist Church? To make what? Disciples of? In other words, following 
the way. Jesus is the way. So Jesus said, read it with me. It's key to your understanding of what it means to be an honest disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Like it or not, humans, we are spatially oriented. And by that, I mean a sense of security comes when we are in a familiar place, such as your home. Don't you love it after a hard day at work or a hard day shopping or a hard day finding something to do? You come home and it's just like, don't have to wear a mask. Not even the one that you put on that has nothing to do with COVID. You can just be yourself. So it's good to be in a familiar place. And we're not always in a familiar place, and so we become uncomfortable. Sometimes we have made a journey so many times that even the the route to the familiar destination becomes comfortable. You know, we have driven I-75 back and forth between Indiana, Ohio, and and Florida uh, since 1989. Hundreds of, usually twice a year, the summer trip, the winter trip, try to keep our kids connected, their family up north. So twice a year, we've, we've worn out four or five vehicles doing this. So I get in the car, you guys remember the old Christmas song? Over the woods, river and through the woods, to grandmother's house we go, the horse knows. There you go, so do our cars. You get in, you turn on the ignition, and you veg out. And then Lisa says, got to get gas. I look down. Oh, I've got a 200 miles. And then the car says, got to get gas. Well, I got 77 miles. And then I realize I'm in Kentucky and it's 100 miles to the next exit with gas. <laughs> but here's the point you find comfort in place, in people, in routines. And even the journey can become routine. And you find comfort in that. But you're not always in a familiar place, are you? Sometimes you are what? Lost. Anybody here ever, here ever get lost? Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, and especially for men, it's hard to ask for what? And it's even worse if you have to backtrack. Oh no, honey, if we go five miles this way, take a right. Go four miles that way, take another right. Another five miles, take a right. And in just four miles, we'll be back going in the direction where we went wrong. Four rights put you right back where you were. Just saying. For you guys that don't know that, it works. But here was my favorite trick with my kids in the back. They would know we were lost. They weren't stupid. We didn't raise vegetables or rocks. They knew we were lost. So I'd hear a little voice in the back seat pipe up, Daddy, are we lost? And I'd say, oh no, kids, we're never lost. We're just exploring. <laughs> if you haven't tried that with the grandkids, it works. They love to be on an exploration. Where'd you go? I went exploring with the grandpa. He got lost again, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> Yes, he did. Lost. You know, when you walk into a strange mall for the first time, next slide. Well, you, you find a kiosk with a map on it, right? Right? And then you look for what? Yeah, you've got to know where you are. It's nice to know where you're going, but you've got to know where you are to get there. And here's the deal. We're spatially oriented, but most of us, not all of us, some of us are OCD. We've got to know each and every step before we take the first step. But for the majority of people, as long as you have a rough idea which direction to strike out in, you're confident that you'll get there. And so you look at this map of the mall, and you go, well, here's where I am, right next to the food court. That's where I'm always at in the mall. You know, Honey, I'll be right here, right where you left me. I may be on my third burrito, but you'll find me, okay? So... You know where you are, and then you find your destination, and you get a rough sense in your mind on how to get where you want to go. And that's not just limited to malls. It's how you find your way around towns and countries and the planet. And eventually, the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe. So this principle is universal. It's timeless. It applies to all of us. Here's the deal. And it applies to this church in our journey. It is far less important that we map out each and every step to get the Radio Shack. It is far more important to know where we are and where Radio Shack is so we can get there and enjoy the journey. Oh, look, honey, you'd look great in that dress. No, Lisa, I don't wear dresses. (laughs) 
most of us are less oriented than we realize. Oh no, I'm just comfortable here, so I don't want to go anywhere else. Better to live with the devil you know than to encounter one you don't. And so we say we've always done it this way. We become change averse. And it is true, the only one who really likes change is a baby with a wet diaper. But change is necessary. Unless you really can stay exactly where you are. But change brings up all that yuck of feeling lost. Next slide, please. And so Jesus, talking to us and them, then and there and here and now, talks about lostness. With parables, he strings together three pearls, the lost what? Sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And you can look at it as a diamond that you turn and look at it through this facet and turn it a little more and look at it through that facet. But there's one overarching theme, and that is lostness. And what he's basically saying is this, and many times we get so tied up in the details of each of those three stories, we miss what Jesus was saying then and now. That this world is not our home. That the things that we find comfort, safety, and familiarity in are not of great value in the kingdom of God. How many of you put a great, and don't raise your hand, how many of you put a great deal of stock in your reputation? The Bible says we should be God's own fool. Are you ready to be foolish for God? Wise in God's eyes, but foolish in the eyes of your family and friends? This is what these parables are really about. It's about this upside-down, inside-out worldview called the kingdom of God. Next slide. Let's read the setup for what Jesus is teaching. Uh, just listen. Tax collectors and sinners. Don't you love that? Tax collectors are so reviled that they actually had their separate category. You had sinners, and then you had tax collectors. So he starts out with the yuckiest of the yucky tax collectors. Really? Them too? And sinners, you mean people like those guys? No, no, people like you and me. So tax collectors and sinners gathered to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, they're in that mix. And the teachers of the law did what? So what's the difference between muttering and hearing or listening? Anybody know a good mutterer? Yeah. We sit in the peanut gallery. I notice we sit in the peanut gallery. We evaluate what's being said. We're not really listening, and we're not trying to understand. We're just saying whether they said it right or we agree with it or not. That's where they were, these uh, people who were supposed to be the brainchild of Israel, the ones that have uh, been given the guardianship of God's great truths of love and mercy and grace. But instead of listening to the one who's the way, the truth, and life, they're just looking for an argument. They're listening for a way to justify their current reality, the status quo that they're on the top of. And so they're not really there to hear Jesus. They're there to mutter. What is it that they mutter? Read it with me, would you? This man welcomes sinners. Oh my gosh. Do you mean you're going to sit down with a cup of coffee with her? Do you know what she did last year? Don't care. What? And you're going to actually invite them into your home and have dinner? No, no, I'm waiting for them to invite me. I'm going to eat with them. And I'm bringing the beef. Really? You can't associate with those kind of people and be our kind of person. So this is the setup. Don't, don't let anybody teach you something alternate to the way Jesus set up this story. It was in that moment that this string of pearls came to Jesus' heart and mind. So primarily, who is he teaching? Everybody. But there's two different groups, right? You've got the tax collector. And you got the sinners, and then you got the Pharisees, scribes, and the ones who should know better but refuse to know. So this is the context for these three stories about being lost. And if you don't walk away with a sense of who Jesus is saying is the most lost of all, then you didn't want to hear the word of truth. So next slide, please. Here's the stories. Jesus told them this parable, first, first of three. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Won't you leave the 99 and go find the lost sheep? Have you heard that before? Yes. Do you really believe it? We like to think we believe it. 
But would you sacrifice your children to save somebody who know Christ, to save somebody who doesn't? Well, Jerry, I believe it. I just don't believe it that way. I believe it like I heard it as a sixth grader in Sunday school. It's about the value of each human being. Yes, it is. And it's the value of the mission that none should be lost. He says there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over what? One sinner who repents turns than over the 99 righteous who did not need to turn. So where are we spending our energies as individual Christians, Christian families, Christian communities called churches? Are we spending most of our energy working on the saints or working on the sinners? Those with ears to hear, hear. Next slide, please. You know, there's a place. How many of you have been to Ocean City, Maryland? Isn't it beautiful? I used to love that in the service, man. We'd slip away, uh, stationed at, uh, I did the triad there, uh, the White House, the Pentagon, and Andrews Air Force Base, the secure comm there. And so, I don't know, three or four, six-month TDYs. We'd love to switch, slip away to Ocean City, Maryland. You know why? Girls. Welcome to an honest church. <laughs> and today's about honesty. In Ocean City, Maryland, 2017, the Ocean City Life-Saving Station opened as a living museum. It began as an actual rescue mission. Uh, it's the forerunner of the U.S. Coast Guard. Isn't that cool? Uh, but here's the deal. When they originally opened, they were responsible, literally responsible for and did rescue hundreds of crews in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, the bell would go off, people would rally, they'd grab the, the equipment and take the boats out and get into the raging sea and go out and try to rescue as many as they could. What happened in 2017? Did you remember? I just told you. They became a what? A living museum. So they still talk about the glory days. They still talk about the way uh, the mission that they were commissioned with was to go out and rescue people drowning in the waves. But they don't do it. They just talk about it. I wonder what you think about that. I'm going to ask you to watch this video clip to think even further. Can we show that clip about the cruise ship and the battleship? very serious question. How do you choose? One of the things that's broken my heart over 28 years of ministry is churches led by charismatic pastors, and each one of them has been a male pastor. And in my eyes, and sometimes in the eyes of the world, they're handsome men, charismatic leaders. 
And then a very basic fundamental rule of life called integrity. They crossed a line with parishioners or staff. Ultimately, what that says in the moment, they did not bow to a higher authority. And they assumed because they were running a large cruise ship with everybody happy, that somehow the mission wasn't important and integrity didn't really matter. Each one of those men I love, each one of those men I understand because I'm a man, and I faced those moments where I chose to be the captain of a battleship instead of a captain with privileges in a cruise ship. You need to hear that. Because unless the captain bows to a higher authority, you cannot trust the mission or the nature of the church or how exciting or big it is. I am bowed to Jesus Christ. And I am sold out for saving souls. And I caution you strongly about following somebody who is not. No matter how handsome, no matter how charismatic. Because that will not win a soul and it will not move the kingdom forward. Churches that have experienced that kind of leadership have taken decades to recover. So be careful. This is not just a nice analogy. It's a critical difference in somebody who is leading a church and somebody who's enjoying the privileges of being a pastor. Let's continue this story about the differences. Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Just listen. So suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses just one. If I lost 10%, you know, one of the rules in finance is don't throw good money after what? Bad. Now Jesus says, let's flip that around. And you go, what? Are you crazy? Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and do what? Search carefully until when? She finds it. And when she finds it, she does what? She calls her friends and neighbors together and says, let's party. I found what was lost. And here's the point. If church doesn't feel like a party, it's because nobody's finding the way, the truth, and the life. You see, rejoicing comes when there is new life. Rejoicing comes when that which is unforgivable is forgiven. And that which you want to crumple up and throw away and discard is renewed in the image of Christ. So in that story of the woman caught in adultery, and it shouldn't just been the woman, the law said both she and the man should be brought before the ruling elders. At the very end, do you remember what Jesus said to her? Everybody remembers that, you know, he says, uh, you know, neither do I condemn you. There you go. Love it. But then go and sin no more. You've been restored not to sin again. You've been restored to live again. So the idea of finding the lost, putting our focus on bringing people to Christ and growing up in Christ and restoring them in Christ isn't about being good people. It's not about being altruistic or Pollyannish. It's about creating the place where the Holy Spirit can do what we cannot do. But we are in charge of creating a life-saving station that doesn't, doesn't just talk about the glory days, doesn't just remember when we had you know, the children's wing and the youth wing filled. It's how do we fill it again? How do we resume the mission of Christ and let go of the pain of yesterday? This is the story in the middle of this string of three pearls. Are we willing to not be satisfied with a nine? Us four and no more. Are we willing to look for the lost? The kids that are alienated in our community. Our elders that feel completely forgotten by their family and their friends that are distance away or have died. Do we understand that the mission has not changed and rejoicing comes in living out that mission? Now, now here's something I want you to know, not because I want you to teach you child development stages, but children uh, uh, around age eight or nine 
still cannot um, construct a good cognitive map of their environment. In other words, they can't imagine. They can see where they are, but they're not quite sure how to get where they need to be. You, they can stand in a mall and look at a map. And they know they're here, and they know they want to get over to Toys R Us, but they can't, in their mind, figure out the way to get there. The Bible assures us that until you give your heart to Jesus Christ, there's something that has not come alive inside of you. So like that child, you may know where you are, and you may know where you want to be, but the tools that you have been given in this life are not sufficient for you to connect the dots and know the way how to get there. So, what do we do? And I'm not immune to this. I'm a guy. You know, I can stand in front of the refrigerator for five minutes looking for a bottle of ketchup until I finally swallow my pride and say, Lisa, where's the ketchup? And I know she's going to say, did you move the milk? And I'll go, no. And I move the milk, and right there it is. I swear it materialized. Beam me up, Scotty. Here we go. So none of us get immune to this. It's easy for all of us to fall asleep. We're not Calvinist in our thinking. I'm not going to say that's simplistic, but once saved, always saved. And then to say when somebody slips, oh, they weren't really saved. I don't think that's understanding human nature at a deep enough level. We can all lose the catch-up now and then. Jeremiah 29, 13 explains this part of our human condition. Read it with me, would you? You will seek me and find me when? Stop there. Not everybody is even seeking. They're not. Even people who sit in church week after week, year after year, they actually may be doing that for all kinds of reasons. It has nothing to do with I'm here, I don't want to be here, I want to be there, and I want to learn the way to get there. But that's not why they're there. They're there for the reason. All kinds of people. I've been there for years. I've slipped back into that for years. But if you seek me and find me, when will that happen? When you seek me with all your heart. You know, the truth is, if my life depended on finding that ketchup, I'd find it. But I've got an easy out. What's my easy out? There you go. Life principle, I'll throw it in for free. It's not in the notes. What's automatic for you is manual for somebody else. Somebody's doing work that you probably should do yourself. Okay, so here's the deal. Jeremiah 29, 13, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So if you're really not interested in finding the way, if you're not really interested in anything other than religious or philosophical ideas, then just go to a Sunday school or go to a a local college that teaches comparative religions and find out what everybody thinks. I think that's a good thing. I've done that and continue to study other world religions. All truth is God's truth, but not every way is God's way. All right? So there's a guy. Next slide, please. Anybody recognize the guy on the left, the tall guy? Penn Gillette. Yeah, Penn and Teller. That's exactly right. Magic Act. They're Honestly, they're just great social commentaries. They're not Christian. They're not. But Penn Gillette gets the point of this parable. Let's watch that video clip together. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we uh, we talk to folks, and you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position after I was all done, big guy probably about my age. And he walked over to me and he said, um, I was here last night at the show and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition uh, Psalms, from the New, just part of the New Testament little book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane. I'm not crazy. <laughs> and he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. It was really wonderful. I believe he knew 
that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like to show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. And I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave me that book. That's all I wanted to say. Penn Gillette, a confirmed, thoughtful atheist gets the point of the parable of the lost coin. Do you? Do you understand that if you're satisfied with the nine coins you have and will not search for the one that's lost, then the meaning that Jesus tried to convey then and now has been lost on you? Let's wrap up this string of three pearls. Luke 15, 11, next slide. Just listen. Jesus continued. And everybody knows this story the best because we just love to wrap things into this story. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said, Father, give me my share of the estate. In other words, saying that before your father's dead is saying, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance now. That's not a very pleasant thing. It's shocking. So he divided his property between them, and that is even more shocking. Why would you do that with this recalcitrant son? So the younger son set off for a far country and did what? He invested that money, right? A tenfold, threefold? No, no. He squandered it. He dug a hole in his life and threw the money in the hole and forgot where the hole was. He lost it in selfless, or excuse me, self-centered living. Next slide, please. So after he'd spent everything his father had given him, he, he began to be in need. So he hired him out to feed the pigs. This is a good Jewish boy. He said, How would that work? Not so good. I love the story when Jesus sends all the demons into the herd of swine and they go off the cliff. Do you remember that story? You know what I call that story? Deviled ham. Yeah, boom, pump. yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the lowest of the low for a good Jewish boy, okay? He's feeding pigs, you know? Uh, when he came to his senses, don't you love that part of the story? When he came to his senses, he said, my father's hired men have more than enough food to eat, and here I am starving to death in this foreign country, and I'm working with pigs. So he got up and went to his father. Stop right there. So he came to his senses because somebody didn't go out and make it easy for him. Sometimes our charity serves Satan instead of Christ. There's such a thing as toxic charity where your position in the world, your position in your own eyes is based on you being the hero in someone else's story. And so instead of empowering them to live the life that they can and that Christ died to give them, we keep them at a level that Satan uh, continues to disempower and abuse them. So be careful what's being said here. The father didn't chase the son. The son was allowed to do stupid stuff. And then he came to his senses. Now, sometimes they don't, because sometimes the stupid stuff you do, here, hold my beer and watch this, watch this, and then they fall into the river they're trying to jump and drown. Sometimes that happens. But do you believe people have the right for self-determination? God does. And Jesus believes it. That's the point of this part of this parable. So my father's hired men have more food to eat than, than I do. I'm starving, so I'm going to get up and I'm going to go home because nobody rescued me. There's a difference between finding somebody and introducing them to Jesus, growing up up in Christ, doing for them what needs to be done that they cannot do for themselves, and keeping them in a servient role. Maybe it's the drugs. 
Maybe it's to broken self-image. Maybe it's to uh, whatever. But our job isn't to keep people enslaved. Our job is to free them in the power of Christ. Next slide, please. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. What's that tell you? All you Bible teachers out there, I know there's a bunch of you. What's that tell you? What was the father doing while the son was absent? He was watching for any sign that the son would be turning around and coming to his senses. So from a long distance away, it wasn't a surprise visit. It was a surprise that he had come around that day, but the father had been looking. So he does what? He does what? He ran to, do you have this image of this old guy getting close enough to death, this young son feels bold enough, said, you know, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance. I can't wait another 10 weeks. So he's, he hikes up his skirt. See, I told you real men wear dresses. <laughs> he hikes up his skirt, shows those knobby white knees, and runs to his son. And he didn't say, huh, told you so. I knew you'd be back. What's he say? He says, I love you. Does he use words? He does what? Touches him. You know what? Human touch is imperative. It conveys acceptance, understanding but not necessarily agreement, all right? So he begins this well-worn speech. Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Here's the greater truth for us sitting in this room. We never were worthy to be called God's son. It is only by the blood of Jesus Christ applied to us that we are worthy of God's notice. This is the gospel. So next slide, please. But the father said to his servants, read it with me, because this is what we're to be saying to one another as we encourage ourselves to, to stop worrying about the rescue mission that, that worked 10, 15, 30 years ago and rebuild the life-saving station. This is marching orders. Read it with me, would you? Quick, bring the best robe and put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Let's celebrate. Sunday morning has got to be a celebration and not with leftovers, but with the good stuff. The china, you've only pulled out four times in 40 years of marriage. Bring it out. You know, the good stuff. Not the, well, we can get that to Dollar Tree or, or Oriental Trader. No, the good stuff. For this son of mine that was dead is now what? Alive again, and he was lost, is now found. Inside of that is this truth. If you are sincere, in your belief or understanding that there is a heaven and a hell. And the default position is hell, not heaven. But Jesus came and died so that as few as possible would go to hell and as many as possible would come into the internal embrace of God's forever love. If you understand that mission and believe it, then why wouldn't we put out the best for Sunday morning and expect and go out and bring in guests and let them experience not, oh, we've got to hang on. As long as the church survives till I die, I don't care what happens after that. That's nonsense. This is a party. And we've got to make sure people know about the party and are glad when they find it and come. Why? Not because we're good people, because we're not. Not because this is a great place, because it's not. It's because they are living in their deadness. And they will come alive. What was lost will be found and there will be joy for everyone. So how do you get unturned around? You know, even Daniel Boone got lost in the woods once in a while. And he'd say, well, I was just confused for several weeks. So my story to the kids in the back seat wasn't that far off from an American legend. Many people are not letting Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. They're not letting him be their guide. So they're on some random spiritual journey. They're, they're following the, the path of least resistance in life with no apparent purpose other than to, to find something or someone who will at least temporarily make them feel better about themselves. And when that wife or that husband no longer does, then they're disposable. And when that career no longer seems satisfied, then I go out and find another brass ring to pull on the merry-go-round of life, hoping that this time it will be different. 
And so they are struggling. They truly are lost. You hear them say things like, all roads lead to Rome. And by that, what they're saying is that all religions are equally true. There's no greater lie from the pit of hell than that. Start with the obvious. The great divide is this. Is there a God or not a God? Uh, Atheism is a religion. There's not a God. Theists, including Christianity, believe there is a God. Those two both can't be true. So even at the highest possible level, the argument that all religions are the same is patently false. It's beyond nonsense. It is a tool of Satan to confuse and to allow people to remain lost in the weeds. Here's the central claim we've read and talked about and thought about this morning. Jesus is God incarnate. He's not a great prophet. He's not a good teacher. He wasn't a good man who led a life that we were to use as an example. He was all of that, but he was, first and foremost, God incarnate. And he puts that in such a way, literally with his death, for that reason and no other, he claimed to be God. So that gives each of us a choice. C.S. Lewis said it well. He's either a liar, in which case, why would you believe him? Or a lunatic. Anybody can claim to be God or a poached egg. But are they? So he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And if he's Lord, you better bow down at his feet. And while you're bowing there, invite your family and friends, your neighbors and strangers to come and bow with you. The Apostle Paul uh, talks about this come to your senses moment that we just read in the last pearl and the string of the lost. It's found in Romans 10, 9. Read it with me, would you? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved. We'll talk about this over our years together. Saved, the, the Greek word is sozo. It has three very serious senses. Uh, there, there's a sense that I was saved by what Christ did on the cross. That's the past tense. I am being saved. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength I need, Philippians 4.13. I am being saved by the crucified Christ living in my life in the Holy Spirit. I will be saved. The future tense, when Christ comes again in final victory, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and the we who are still living will be caught up in the air with them, And the kingdom will finally be fully restored. Saved. If you think this is about anything other than salvation, you have bought into a lie. Because the world is lost. It's lost. Show that last slide, please. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And I'll add this one. The lost church. Certain that safety lies in a direction other than Christ. The leaders in the church today, like the leaders in the movement of Yahweh in Jesus' day, they've lost their way. And they're ignoring the proven path and looking for alternate ways. Oftentimes when I talk to people who or in this many roads lead to Rome syndrome, it's because Christians have put them on that path. Uh, Unconvinced followers of Jesus say that, oh, you'll be okay. Now, for me, Jesus and his stories bring me comfort. And we'll talk about the great revivals. But there is no great revival today. If that's you, I am sorry. If someone who's convinced you that this is not the most critical issue on planet Earth, I'm sorry. But according to this book, and according to the Jewish carpenter that I follow and serve, the higher power, the only power I will bow to, they are lost. But those who have ears to hear, hear. Amen? Amen. Dave, bring us home, brother. Right church, wrong pew. (laughs) I love that. I like that joke. Would you please stand? We're going to close our service this morning with How Great Thou Art.
God is good. Grace is great. Aren't you glad? Uh, would you just bow your head with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for these stories of lostness, and we're so grateful that the Christ in heaven left the glory there and came to earth to do all that needs to be done and all that must be done for any to be saved. Father, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice here in this church or online that has not yet received Christ as their Savior, if there's a question mark for any reason over the way into an eternity of forever with you, Father, let them simply say something like this in their heart. Jesus, as best I can, I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that you are the eternal Son of God, that you have died to remove my sin and to give me a new heart, a desire to live in a way that brings honor and glory to you. For all the stuff that I didn't do right, for the things that I won't get right today and tomorrow, I just accept that your grace is sufficient. So cleanse my heart. Take away that judgy spirit that comes from a heart that feels judged. Allow me to be the person you created for me to be and who Jesus died for me to become. In Jesus Christ's name and all God's kids said, amen. amen. Have a beautiful week, guys.